Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And can you just believe Thanksgiving is over, it's done, it's finished. And the Christmas 2023 season is here, it's begun. I can hardly believe that this is the end of 2023. Time is just flying. I mean, we, we just put away the Christmas decorations and we gotta haul them all out again. But I love Christmas, I love this time of year. And so keeping with the season, we're starting a brand new series entitled, Jesus is the Reason for the Season. And this message is the first message in that series is entitled, Jesus, the Spirit of Peace. A scripture is found in Luke chapter two, verse eight through 14. Now there were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Can you just imagine? Those shepherds are minding their own business, taking care of their sheep and trying to keep warm. It's nighttime. The stars are out, the stars are shining brightly, and a crisp wind is whipping along the open fields. The shepherds were probably huddled together, maybe around an open fire, talking with each other, wishing that they were in a nice warm bed right now. They were probably discussing maybe Hanukkah and all the good food, all that good tasting food that their families had just enjoyed that day and how they missed the celebrations because of the sheep. When suddenly an angel appeared right in front of them and a brilliant light called the glory of the Lord shone all around them, lighting up the darkness and blinding their eyes. Needless to say, those good old boys were terrified. They had never seen a sight like this before, much less a real live angel. And now, to make matters worse, the angel begins to speak to them, saying, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Fear not, this angel says, but how can they keep their hearts from racing? How can they keep their hands from trembling? How can they keep their knees from quaking, from knocking together? This is a terrifying sight. But the words were comforting words. The angel says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Good news of great joy is always good news. But this is even better news because it's not just good news for the Israelites. It's not just good news for the Jews or the rich or the poor or the white or the black or Asian or Spanish or any other particular culture. It is good news for who? For all the people, every single soul that will ever live. Every single soul who has lived and who has kept the word of God and who will live, who will be born from then on. It is good news and not just good news. It is great news because it brings great joy. But you know what? Sadly, 
many people don't find it to be very joyous. They are called Christ haters. They hate the name that is meant to bring great joy to everyone who hears the name. Why does it bring great joy? Because it's the only name that is given to us where we can receive life. And not just life, but life more abundantly. Well, if that is the case, why do people hate it so? Why do people hate that name? Because of two things. Look with me at John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, Jesus claims to be because he is the light of the world. That light, it lights up the darkness, or rather, it exposes the darkness. Now, I want you to flip back five or so chapters to chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You see, men hate the light because their works are evil and the darkness hide their evil deeds. While on the other hand, the light exposes their evil deeds. So they hate the light for exposing their evil, thus showing them to be who they truly are. And that's the reason why men reject the light. But when they reject the light, they also reject the good news that comes with the light, which results in rejecting eternal life. That is the bottom line. They actually reject eternal life, a life with Jesus. And that is the good news. It's the good news of peace and goodwill toward men. Goodwill toward men mean peace with God and eternal life with Jesus. But we who are being saved accept the light and rejoice over the good news because it includes us. Because what did the angel say? It is for who? For all men. It is life to those who believe. It is life to those who accept it. It is peace and goodwill toward all men. No one who comes is left out. No one who comes is rejected. No one who comes will be turned away. Why? Because of this verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. See, this very day back then, a Savior was born. Born to, born to us, everyone who will believe. He is a savior to us because he came to save that which is lost. And not just a savior, but as the Samaritans put it in John chapter 4, verse 42, the savior of the world. He's the savior of the world. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is the savior of the whole world. No one is left out who wants eternal life. There's no other name given unto man by which he must be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Can you just imagine the joy those words brought those frightened shepherds? A Savior is born. A Savior who is none other than the promised Messiah. The promised one whom they have been waiting for for centuries now, century after century, these people, the Israelites, have been waiting for this promised Messiah. Could it really be, they're thinking? You know, they're, they're reasoning with themselves. It's about time. But after all of this time, 
after all of the waiting? Can it really be him? But who else could it be since his birth is being announced to us by an angel of the Lord? And we see the brightness of the glory of the Lord shining all around us. These shepherds are probably reasoning in, in their hearts about what's going on around them. Then, as if for confirmation, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In that brilliant light of the glory of the Lord that shone all around those shepherds that night, there appeared a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The heavenly host joined in with that angel who came to announce the birth of Jesus. And they all began praising the Lord God Almighty, giving Him glory and worshiping Him for the great news and for the great things that He has done. And this is what they say. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The prophet Isaiah prophesied, peace, Peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord. To the far and to the near. You know what? That includes us because we are the far. They were the near. But we were not left out. We were not excluded. We are the far. And we praise the Lord that he gave us also an opportunity to accept his son, Jesus Christ. This peace that the angel spoke of does not primarily denote a relationship between several people. Neither does it denote a attitude, but rather it is a state, as in a time of peace or a state of peace. Jesus came to reconcile us back to God. In other words, he came to make peace between God and man for we all like sheep have gone astray we all like a crooked arrow have missed the target and we all like a wandering vagabond have wandered away from our God but for while we were still his enemies while we were still sinners Christ that's Jesus the Christ the spirit of peace chose to die for us and reconcile us back to a loving and forgiving God. He has reconciled us back to himself. I want you to take a look with me, please, at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. And all things are of God, who hath what? Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses upon them, and hath committed unto us the word of what? Reconciliation. Four times in these two verses, Paul speaks of reconciliation that is God through his son Jesus Christ reconciled us lost people back to himself God did not impute to us what was rightfully ours namely the penalty of our transgressions but rather he himself Jesus took our sins, our transgressions upon his own self in order to take away our sins by bearing our sins himself in his own flesh when he suffered and died upon the cross. Bottom line is, Jesus brought peace between God and man, but not all men, as we said, believe. Therefore, not all men accept. Look at what Jesus told the Jews in Luke chapter 19, verse 42. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that made for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. They 
did not recognize the day of their visitation. People are so self-absorbed these days that they just don't have time for God. They don't recognize the day of their visitation. And sadly, they lose out on the peace offered by God. Their lives are so busy with things. Their lives are so busy with stuff and getting ahead with, with events and plannings and doing things that, as I said, they just don't have the time for God. Jesus' birth was glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That was his birth announcement. Think about it. Glory to God, but peace and goodwill toward all men. Isaiah 53 verse 5 is a prophecy explaining the coming Messiah, which would purchase our peace by taking upon himself the chastisement that brings us peace. All of that was fulfilled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gives the spirit of peace. Everyone is searching for peace. It's right before our eyes. Jesus offers each one of us peace right here, right now, with forgiveness, with hope, with a future, and with healing. Check it out, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It's a threefold work of grace. The body, healing. The soul, mental. As in, generational curses can be broken. Harassing spirits can be rebuked and cast out. Anxiety can be healed. Depression can be healed. All of those mental stuff can be healed in the name of Jesus. Then it's the Spirit. It's salvation. Jesus offers eternal life to everyone who believes on His name. But you know what? If one of these things, one of these three, are out of place or out of sync, there is no peace. What I mean is this. You can have a peace of mind knowing that you are saved, knowing that you're going to heaven, knowing that you have eternal life in Jesus while you're sick with cancer, for instance. But your body itself is not at peace. It is actually, most of the time, in pain because of the cancer. But we are to pursue peace. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Argentina and Chile were having disputes about where the border should be. Argentina thought that it should be in one place. Chile thought that it should be somewhere else. The dispute was getting so heated that the two countries nearly went to war. But fortunately, with the help of the Catholic Church, they worked out their border dispute. They felt that it was in their mutual best interest to make a treaty to live in peace with each other. The decision to live in peace was such a huge accomplishment by the two governments that they decided to place a symbol of peace high upon their natural borders, the Andes Mountains. For their symbol of peace, they chose to create a great statue of Jesus Christ with his arms outstretched and they named it Christ of the Andes. The inscription that they wrote, it reads like this, Sooner shall these mountains crumble into dust than the Argentines and the Chileans break the peace sworn at the feet of Christ the Redeemer. You know, Jesus enters into just such a covenant with us. He, it sounds almost just like that. This is what his promise says. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
This is the meaning of what Jesus was saying. He said, he will never, ever break his word to us. Nor will he forget to fulfill all, not just some, but all of his promises to us. His word will never, never pass away. And what's more fitting than Christmas time for us to remember that Jesus came to the earth to bring us peace and reconciliation with God. That's a promise. Isaiah calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. Then he goes on to say that of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And speaking of this, this prophecy that we just read, God said that the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And thus the heavens and the earth may pass away. And to be sure, they will pass away according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But what God has promised, which is to fulfill his word, to bring his word to pass, that will never pass away. And we thank God for just such a promise. But through it all, Jesus is our peace. I want us to look at a few verses in the book of Ephesians. This is what Paul wrote, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Paul wrote concerning Jesus that he, Jesus, he himself is our peace. Meaning that Jesus himself is our peace. Because Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. That is, there was a dividing wall between us and God. Represented by the veil in the temple. We were not allowed to go in to this temple. We were not to pass through this veil and enter his presence. If anyone was to pass the veil and enter the Holy of Holies, the Lord would appear and they would die. But when Jesus died on the cross, that veil, that thick veil was split. It was torn from top to bottom, opening up that way into the Holy of Holies because God himself tore that veil. It could not be torn by man. It was too thick of a veil. And it didn't tear from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom. Letting us, mere man, come into the presence, the very presence of Almighty God. That's called reconciliation. Jesus is the spirit of peace. And through reconciliation, he has killed hostility and ushered in peace between us and God. Thus, we can extend peace now to the brethren, and the brethren extend peace to us. We can live in peace as children of God. But before we can have peace within the brethren, before we can have peace with each other, before we can have peace with God, we must accept God. We must be at peace with God. Look at Job chapter 22, verse 21. It says, Submit to God. First, do what? Submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. So the first thing we must do is to submit ourselves to God. Then we can be at peace with Him. And only then are we a prime candidate for prosperity. See, once we submit to God, He then justifies us by our faith in Him. But what is justification? Well, simply put, this is how someone said it, justification, just as if we have never sinned. 
We are justified before God because of the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus on the cross. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, Christians, are justified by faith and are at peace with our God. So let me ask you this question. Is that speaking of you? Are you justified by faith? And are you at peace with God? Remember, His return is near. And that great white throne judgment is right behind. Are you ready for that? If you were to die today, Lord forbid, but if per se you were to pass on, are you sure that you would go to heaven? Are you sure that you would live throughout all eternity with Jesus? What I'm asking you, are you saved? Are you living your life for Jesus? If you're not sure, if you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, you can be sure. Because Jesus makes that promise. He will not turn away anyone who comes to him. So all you have to do is to ask. Jesus will hear. And if he hears, he will answer. And if he answers, he will forgive. So, if you want to be sure where you, where you will spend eternity, repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I come to you, Lord. I accept the free gift of salvation. I accept that peace, that peace that you give between God and man. That peace in our life, shalom peace, I accept it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, that simple prayer, the Lord will hear and he will forgive you. Because he's, it's not his will that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And you need to get right with Jesus. So congratulations to everyone who said that prayer, who has accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. I wish you all of the best. And I want to say Merry Christmas in this Christmas season. I hope you get all your shopping done. I have, hope you get all the cooking done, this Christmas cooking, and get your decorations done. It's a very busy time of the year, but don't get so busy where you forget about your relationship with Jesus. He is the reason for the season. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay.